So for, first off, I, I wanted to say I hope you were all safe from fire. As you you probably know from the news down here, we've got a lot of we've got fires, um, a lot of fires in Northern California, a lot of fires in Oregon, a lot of fires in Washington State, and um, one of our hermitages uh, has a fire going towards it. The weather seems to be changing. We're just hoping for the best. We had to evacuate, and. Uh, our other hermitage, two days in a row, we've heard of fires out by it. So we're hoping it, it's, it's gonna be okay. The, the, the first one was put out fairly quickly. Um, but, you know, the, it's, it's been hot, it's always cooled off a little, and there's been high winds, and there's a lot of fuel, a lot of dry grass. And, and so, but I hope you, you are all okay, I, you know, seeing, a bit where some of you are from, I think maybe you're okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the uh, three pure precepts. So as you know, in Buddhism, we have the 16 precepts in, in our um, Soto Zen practice. The uh, three refuges, Buddhadharma Sangha, the three pure precepts, or in Zen Master Dogen called them the three pure collective precepts. And then there's the 10 great precepts. So what I'd like to talk about specifically tonight is the three pure precepts. And they are cease from evil, do only good, do good for others. Um, if you're familiar with these precepts um, in the Theravadan tradition, they're translated slightly differently. They're translated as um, cease from evil, do only good, purify your mind or purify your heart and where along the line that that changed I don't quite know the history of it other than possibly some certain periods of time in Buddhism uh, it was felt that there was there was too much focus on personal enlightenment and the welfare of, of um, others you know became something that was very important so in our Soto Zen precepts we say do good for others. Okay, um, they are called the three pure precepts, or as I said, the three pure collective precepts. And, and collective, as I understand it, means that they're taken together. So if you're ceasing from evil, you're doing only good, you're doing good for others. If you're um, doing good, you're ceasing from evil, and you're doing good for others. If you're doing good for others, you're, you're doing the other two also. So, so they're kind of inter interwoven, um, although there is also a slightly different emphasis with each one of these. And the first of these, cease from evil, is said to be the source of all the laws of Buddha. Um, because um, partly what it, it means is uh, our ability to restrain and refrain um, from things that cause harm to ourselves and others. And it's, and it's such a powerful action, action or non-action, uh, depending. But to, to, to be able to restrain ourselves, to not say that thing that we don't really need to say that's harmful, to not do that action, uh, which time we know from um, looking at our karmic past has caused problem again and again and again. So rather than doing it, we just don't do it. We, we restrain ourselves. And, and, and no matter how far you go, I think, in, in the practice, that basic restraint is still with, with you as a, as a real fundamental action that has a real um, effect on, on what, what it is you um, do to yourself in the world. Um, so I would also say, when we say ceasing from evil, in Buddhism, evil is suffering. So it's not, it's not the evil of, quite the evil of Christianity, but evil is that which causes suffering to ourselves and others. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's, it's ceasing from suffering and the things that cause suffering is, a, a, um, a holding back, and in that holding back, we can let go. It's a powerful thing. You know, we 
the basics of meditation, the letting go, the letting go of those things that, that are harmful, um, that cause difficulties for ourselves and others. And I think, I always like to say is we all have a PhD in suffering. You know, we all know about suffering, uh, human suffering. And so we can really gain a lot of knowledge from that PhD in suffering. And one of the fundamental things that we can do to not cause more suffering is to restrain ourselves. You know, it's, it's a wonderful quality um, of kind of stuffing it back in. You know, it's not, it's not walking around not not doing anything, not engaging, but but it's it's realizing, well, I don't have to do this certain action. I don't have to follow through on this certain thought. Okay. Second of the pure precepts, do only good. So this is about making good choices in our lives. Again, we've got this PhD in suffering, and we know certain things cause suffering, so we can deduce from that when we look at it, well, if I don't do that, or, and I do the opposite, or I do something that's positive, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's a good thing for myself and others. Um, in some ways, it's a good beyond good and evil, good and bad. It's not that, uh, it's, it's, it's a much deeper understanding of the word, what is good. It's, it's what is wholesome, what, what benefits ourselves and others. And it, it comes in a myriad form of things. It can come in an action. It can come in restraining ourselves. That can be what is good. Okay. Um, then we have do good for others. Okay. As I say in the, in the Theravadan, they say um, purify your mind or purify your heart. Well, I think doing good for others is really purifying your heart because it's really the intention of our heart to do things that benefit people, that benefit the human race, that benefit our world. Um, but what it what it isn't, it isn't going around being a do-gooder, you know, just you know, popping in everywhere, and because um, it's not that we can't do good. It's just we don't kind of actively. We don't need to actively be looking around to see where we can do good. It's, it's a much more natural process. Uh, you know, there's a, that saying, the helping hand strikes again. So it's, it can be that people are, we're trying to help, but actually we're making a worse, we're making a worse mess of it. We just leave it alone. Um, that's sometimes the best way we can help other beings is just to leave them alone and trust they can work it out. And there are times when from our experience, from our wisdom, from our compassion that we can help beings. Great Master Dogen says that the stupid believe that they will lose something if they give help to others. But this is completely untrue for benevolence helps everyone, including oneself. So benevolence is one of the four wisdoms. And really what it addresses is uh, wise ways of helping beings. That's what, that's what we gain from our uh, meditation practice, um, is, is insight into what are wise ways of helping beings, which again, can be an action and it can be a non-action. Um, both action and non-action have karmic consequence, okay? So, uh, and they can have good karmic consequences. As I say, sometimes the best thing is to leave other people be. Trust that they can work it out for themselves. And then sometimes by doing something that's positive, uh, without you know feeling we're the great one, we're the chosen one or something, we're just doing something that's positive and good, it has a really good effect and it has kind of a rippling effect on people. It's like throwing a stone in a pond and the ripples just go out and out and out. So as we're, as we are, uh, as we can sit still and get better insight into the consequences of our non-action and our actions, because as I say, they both have common consequences, 
we gain wisdom into what is good to do. And that's really what these collective precepts are addressing, what is good to do, what benefits ourselves and others. And I think just lastly, I want to say that, um, so these are three collective precepts, they're all joined together, but, but they have separate elements in some way, some ways. And then you can take these three pure precepts and apply them to the 10 great precepts. So you have 30 precepts there, just not 10. And you see each of those different ways of, of going at it and, and uh, apply them to the precepts. And, and it can be very helpful. It can give us insight into, you know, what is the thing that we should refrain from? What is something good we might do? And what is something good we might do to benefit others? So that's my short, but... <laughs> short, but sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So what I wanted to talk uh, about today was to address the questions of, you know, how do we put the teachings into practice in everyday life? And how do we establish and maintain a meditation practice that's realistic for the situation that we find ourselves in? So, you know, the practice that we do in the serene reflection meditation tradition isn't something that we just do, you know, when we sit on our cushion during formal meditation. Um, you know, really, this is a practice that, um, you know, where we learn to bring our meditation and the precepts, um, as Rip Master Daishin was talking about, into our everyday lives. So, uh, there's a monk in our order who likes to use this analogy that our practice isn't just something that, you know, we do on the weekend, like a yoga class. I think that's a really good analogy. Um, you know, it's, it's, what we do is we bring what we've learned on the cushion. We're trying to, to bring it to all aspects of our lives, you know, our interactions with people, how we think about and treat ourselves, how we treat, you know, the food we prepare and the things that we use, uh, you know, really the list goes on and on. When we learn to bring meditation and precepts to all aspects of our lives, you know, it's really transformative. You know, imagine being in a situation where someone's screaming at you and instead of responding in anger, um, you know, seeing actually that we have a choice, knowing that it's possible for us to be still in the midst of any conditions. I think last class, Reverend Allard, he spoke of the Four Noble Truths. You know, the, the Buddha taught that suffering exists, the cause of suffering is clinging, there's a cessation of suffering, and that we can find this by following the Noble Eightfold Path. So I want you to take a moment and think back about, you know, what prompted you to learn uh, how to meditate or what piqued your interest in Buddhism or a religious path. And I think um, that many people will have had a very direct experience of the First Noble Truth, what Master Daishin was calling the PhD in suffering. Um, for me, this, was, this appeared in a, in a really direct way, you know, when I was traveling with a friend. And I will say that things were going pretty disastrously between us. And there was this moment, you know, it was really kind of clear cut moment where it became very clear that there had to be more to life than just the suffering that I was experiencing. So this is really what launched me on the path of doing something about my life, you know, the Noble Eightfold Path and, you know, trying to put that into practice. And so I think many of us come to the practice because we understand that suffering exists and that we can do something about this by working on ourselves. And the Buddhist teachings offer us this guidebook. So what does it mean to, to put the Buddhist teachings into practice in everyday life? The first thing I'll say is that, you know, we call this a practice for good reason. Our abbess, or Master Man, she often says that our practice is simple, but it's not easy. You know, which is to say, uh, I would say, don't expect you know to be meditating in all situations from the beginning. Um, in a nutshell, one of the most important aspects of our practice is simply paying attention to what we're doing, and what our minds are doing, and when we notice that we've gone off track, you know, bringing our minds back, you know. To the thing that's right in front of us. So at the core, uh, as much as we can, we try to do one thing at a time. 
if you're used to if you're used to eating meals, you know, with the television on or with music on, you know, try just eating to begin with. Try eating uh, one meal a day um, without any distractions going on in the background. Just paying attention to the food and to the people you're with. And it can be really simple things too, um, just brushing your teeth while focusing just on that, or watering the garden, um, vacuuming. Any task really that comes up during the day or evening can be put to good use here. These are all examples of putting the teachings into practice. You know, I see how there's so many distractions available to people, you know, for the average person in 2020. Netflix and other streaming services, there's social media, YouTube, gaming, music, um, you know, Zoom everything. You know, I'd say the list goes on and on. And I think for some people, it's really hard not to be on their phone when there's any downtime in the day. You know, so if you struggle at all with technology, you might just start by setting a goal for yourself from a short period, say 30 minutes or an hour, where you decide you won't pick up your phone. And you know whatever it is you're doing, whether you're going for a walk or a bike ride, reading a story to your child, um, cooking a meal, just try to focus on this one thing. And if you have the opportunity in the future to uh, come to the monastery, um, this is exactly what we do during our working meditation periods. And it actually makes up the bulk um, of our day here. So for me, because I'm I'm the monastery cook. This means putting my attention on preparing the food for the community with you know the most care and attention that I can. And because I work with three other people in the kitchen, it also means giving them my full attention and trying to bring that mind of meditation and precepts you know to our interactions. So as I'm preparing the food, uh, I try to focus on the task at hand while still noticing the smells and sounds of the kitchen. These are all part of the wider attention. And when my mind wanders to something else, um, I bring my back, my, my mind back to whatever you know is in front of me. And I do this over and over, you know, during the working period. Uh, the working meditation. It's important to to kind of just say here. It's not just this pinpoint. Um, mind where all I'm doing is chopping the carrots because if I notice this happens actually quite often I'll hear that something is boiling or I can smell something in the oven it's usually indication I need to go and check that um, so that uh, that paying attention to what I'm doing is also includes this kind of wider circle of other things going on um, around us so, so you know in in the beginning you know when we start you know really trying to apply this to just one thing that we're doing at a time. It might seem that our mind is wandering constantly, um, but just keep bringing your mind back. And actually over time, you will, you will definitely notice that something will shift and that something will get easier. And this is why we call it a practice. So why do we care about bringing our meditation to all our activities of everyday life? I would say because you know when we train our minds to focus on just one task, our formal practice of meditation begins to pervade everything. And suddenly, you know, when we find ourselves in difficult situations, uh, serious injury, devastating news, um, an emergency, you know, we've got these wildfires going on here right now, you know, that rock, that um, foundation of meditation, uh, is there to help us. And because meditation and precepts are not separate, we can begin to apply the precepts in these situations where once we might have panicked or responded in fury or jealousy or whatever arises, you know, in that moment. Um, you know, and this is something, of course, we can do even if we haven't formally taken the precepts. Master Daishin was talking about the three uh, pure collective precepts. And actually, we can all practice these. Um, you know, even if we can't remember any of the other precepts, you know, on killing or stealing or whatever it is, but just just coming back to that, um, or even just fundamentally, um, you know, kindness to ourselves, kindness to other beings. So, so the second question I wanted to address is, you know, how do we establish and maintain a meditation practice that's realistic for the situation that we find ourselves in? 
I think that overall this is probably the most common difficulty that I hear about um, for people who are coming to the practice and even for many people who've been practicing for, for a while. So <laughs> if you if you took science in school, you might understand what I'm about to tell you next. Um, you might remember hearing about Newton's first law of motion in school. Uh, that law says an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. The reason I'm telling you this is because I think it also applies to meditators. You know, if we can begin by establishing a consistent, regular practice, you know, sitting even for five or 10 minutes every day, you know, that momentum will help keep us in motion instead of say, just sitting 45 minutes once a week, because it's really the daily practice of formal meditation that acts upon us um, over time. What I think is really important here is, you know, not setting ourselves up to fail, um, actually setting ourselves up to succeed. You know, if we say to ourselves that we have to sit for 40 minutes um, at a time, um, you know, I think this, this can be a situation where we might be setting ourselves up to fail. Uh, what I used to do, and sometimes I still do, is I tell myself, you know, that I'm just gonna go and sit for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Um, this is often before bed. I know I can sit that long pretty much without falling asleep. Uh, but if I tell myself that I have to sit for 40 or 45 minutes, I'm much less likely to go and sit. Um, I usually find I have, I have things to do um, or, you know, it just all sorts of things will come up in, in between. But if I give myself permission to just sit for a short period of time, what's interesting is that I will often sit for longer than what I intended, intended in the first place. So the second thing I will mention is that um, if at all possible, I think it's really nice you know, if, if you can sit in the morning, um, you know, even if it's just for a really short period. Um, some of you will heard me say this, that when I was a teacher, uh, what I used to do um, is I would sit sometimes on the edge of my bed, even just for a couple of minutes, because the, the situation I found myself in at that point, I just didn't have a lot of time in the morning. And even though I was just sitting for those couple of minutes um, before I, you know, kind of got myself ready for work, um, I actually, in reflection, I see how important that was because it really helped me to set the tone for the day and it, it gave me something to aim for. I think, you know, I, I see how people's lives these days, they seem, it seems to me that people are just busier than ever and we seem to be doing more and more than ever. You know, we have all these things that are supposed to simplify our lives, but actually somehow that space, you know, keeps getting filled up with more and more to do. So, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where you have very little time, just set yourself a goal to meditate that you feel you can keep, even if it's just for five minutes. Um, I think the important thing here with establishing a practice is just the regularity and not so much the length. Um, I mean, if it's, ni it's nice if you do have 15 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes, um, I think it can be really helpful. But if, but if all you can manage is five minutes, that's really great. And what's interesting is what you might find is that um, if you're just working on doing one thing at a time, you might notice actually that you free some time up for yourself um, during the day, because I think as many of us know, it's so easy to kind of escape down a rabbit hole. You might be doing one thing, but then you go to check something on the internet and then half an hour later, you're still doing that thing that you kind of were not intending to do. Um, so, I would just add that. Um, to end, I think I just wanted to say that um, I think it's important that we just start where we are in our practice. So in the beginning, try short periods of meditation, of working meditation, where you just focus on the one thing, you know, by turning off background distractions. And whatever it is that you're doing, just keep bringing your mind back to that. 
think if we want to get our practice off the ground, it's the regular sustained effort of meditation and precepts in our lives in any way that we can incorporate um, in the day that helps us. Um, and by doing so, you know, the practice really permeates our lives and, and helps us to know uh, that true peace of heart.